us so that we might know you forever. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's, there's a verse in the Bible. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And it's not just because it was the very first sermon I ever preached in homiletics class back at Corbin University, uh, but because I think it's, a, it's very important. It's in, in Psalm, it, and by the way, just because it's one verse in the Bible doesn't mean this truth isn't all the way through the Bible from the very, very beginning to the very end. But, but it says, uh, unless the Lord builds a house, they labor in vain who build it. Uh, and I, I don't know about you, some of you are really talented builders, artisan, artisans, craftsmen, and you can do things with your hands. Some of you, not so much. And hopefully you know the difference. Like there's just certain people you don't want building your deck, right? Not, not if you want it to be safe or lasting. And, and some of us who are not more formally trained, uh, didn't, didn't have summer jobs as a framer or any sort of a craftsman, have tried to be self-taught along the way. And there, for those of us who weren't taught that as little kids in our families, there, there's a sharp learning curve. For those of you who didn't grow up in those families, how many of you realized when you're going to build a shed by yourself, and you, you, praise the Lord for YouTube and those kind of tutorials but when you try to do it like you know what i don't want to spend this money i i want to use my hands i want to build something and then with all the the learning and the errors and not having the right tools you realize you end up paying twice as much to build a shed that was half as good you know and, and sometimes that's just how it works in life um, but if we want something that is going to be substantive and lasting that we we want to be going to the expert and that that is god the only person who builds sound lives and things that are eternal and we, we try to do things on our own uh, i was thinking again uh when i moved into our house here when we moved to dallas the garage door that that beam that goes from the unit to the front of the garage that brace was put in wrong it kept ripping out from the wall so ripped out i tried to put it back in and i did it I didn't get it right, so it ripped out a second time. And it took me so long to get it in wrong. And I didn't, I didn't even know it was wrong. And I called the professional out, and 30 minutes later, and I've never had an issue since. But, but in our own spiritual lives, I think we keep trying to do it our, ourselves so many times. And we, we have this nagging thought in our head that God, God will not accept me and, and because I'm not acceptable. And as we just celebrated the Lord's table, we weren't acceptable, but God himself makes us acceptable. And we need to let go of these, these anxieties and these, these voices of guilt that say you, you, you need to be good enough on your own because we can't be good enough on our own. And even as believers who understand that is a theological truth for salvation, we sometimes try to do that with our efforts. We keep trying to build the house as if we're going to offer it up as an offering to the Lord instead of build the house with the Lord. Um, we've read this before in John 15, 5, Jesus speaking about the vine and the branches. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I and him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. And that's a really good verse. I was reading somebody commenting on this years and years ago. He says, notice what our Savior says. He doesn't say, without me, you won't do quite as well. He doesn't say, without me, you'll just do a little bit. He says, without me, you can do nothing. And we need to come to realization, just as we are saved by God's grace, we need to live by that grace. Because it's impossible to live the Christian life in our own strength. Because not only is our salvation of God, but our sanctification is a work of the Spirit. And the impact that we will do is also a work of God. It, it's, and once we realize that, some of us, we just want to be self-made for so long that, that we really struggle against that. But once we finally realize we weren't created to live life on our own. We were created to live with and in relationship with the eternal creator, with God, who works with us and through us and, 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 and in us. 
I, I used to play indoor soccer. Now, full story, I, in high school I was a wrestler. Wasn't super accomplished. I, had, I, had, I was really good at just sabotaging my own seasons. That was, my, that was like my skill set. But, but be that as it may, be that as it may, the, the bad part about wrestling, if you're a competitive type of person, when you finish your competitive wrestling, you don't just come up with your friends like, hey, do you want to come over and wrestle today? This is not a sport you just necessarily do for fun with your buddies. Basketball players go down to a park, softball players join a league, and wrestlers sit around and go like, now what? Well, my sisters all played soccer, and I thought, well, that doesn't look so hard. That was a wrong assumption. So we joined the Salem Indoor League, because I was living in Salem, gathered together a bunch of really good athletes, almost none of whom played soccer, and we proceeded to be horrible for a really, really long time. I think we lost 22 matches straight over like three seasons. We were bad. Good athletes. But I remember when we were in, it's kind of like hockey. They, they sub in and they sub out. And we would fight over who had to go back on the field when we were down like the first game. We were down like by 20 to one. We knew we were in trouble when the entire team um, all wore matching jerseys from a Spanish, like a Mexican league and came out and were doing drills. And we were like, uh-oh. <laughs> Well, over time, I actually wasn't bad. I wasn't I actually wasn't a bad soccer player. I found out maybe I should have done that um, a lot younger. But my teams weren't very good. And then you know what? I've but I got tired of losing. So eventually, you know what I did? I reconstituted my team. And my new theory was this: I'm going to be the worst player on my team. And I surrounded myself with people who were better than I was. And you know what? All of a sudden, it started happening. We started winning. <laughs> Because I wasn't a bad soccer player, but I wanted to be, a, I wanted to be on a great team. And, I, and I, I'm telling this extended story to the point of so many times we want to keep in our own strength spiritually losing just to say, look what I did. I'm the star. If you want to be 0-20, keep going. <laughs> or we could actually say that God himself invites us to be a part of what he is doing when we rely on his on his power, allow him to work through us. And to say, no, look at, look at what I am doing. You get to be a part of that. You get to join in the victory which Jesus has won. And like uh, God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and 4, we'll read these passages again. I know I've read these here before. Remember when God called Moses out to lead his people? He says, it's Exodus in, in Exodus chapter 3 and picking up in verse 7, when he calls him to be the deliverer of the people, God in the burning bush speaks to Moses and says, I have seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to give them a good and large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And then skipping to verse 10, he says, Come now, therefore I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. So he, the Lord, said, I will certainly be with you. And Moses says, skipping down again, what shall I say to them when they ask who has sent me? And God said to Moses in verse 14, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you to me. And if we skip down one more time in chapter 4, all the way in verse 10, then Moses says to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since. You have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, who made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind. Have not I the Lord? Therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and I will teach you what you should say. See, Mo Moses didn't want to go. 
Why didn't Moses want to go? Because when he had tried to rescue the Hebrews many years previously, 40 years previously, he had failed spectacularly. He had been raised in the courts as a prince of Egypt. He thought that the people would understand his position and his power and they would come around him and he would deliver them. But he did it in his own effort and nothing happened. And he's been living under the shadow of that failure for 40 years, hiding on the backside of the desert as a shepherd. He knows he is not capable on his own. He had the resources. He had the training. He had the power in speech and action, and it meant nothing. But now that he knows that he needs the Lord, he doesn't yet realize that that's enough. Because... Moses is saying to God, I don't think you understand who I am. But God is saying to Moses, I don't think you understand who I am. You need to be dependent on me. Your own efforts won't last. Not if they're done in your own strength. You can impress people, but spiritually things that last forever, those are, those are something, there's a work of God in that. You, you, you do learn a lot in life and ministry. I know some of these illustrations I've said a lot. It's because they're things I've learned along the way. If they were your illustrations, they'd be slightly different, but probably some of the same themes. Remember when I was starting off in youth ministry? I wasn't even starting off. I should have known this. And you're trying to keep the attention of the kids. You're trying to imp- you, you love them, but you want, you want them to catch what you've already learned. They, they learn just as slowly as you did sometimes. So uh, you, you try to put together this great program, and I remember one time with my youth staff, we're in Southern California, and we, we have a great event, a great event. The games are great, the music is great, the, I, my lesson is just on point. I'm thinking, we were very excited, all of us, we're like, this is going to be a great night. And by the moment the kids showed up on there, you're like, something is wrong. Pe- best friends were fighting and bickering. People would, we get them to try and play this game, this activity, as we often did. No one's playing. They're like, this is dumb. This is a great game. What, what, what is so dumb about this? And then we play the music. No one is singing. I go to speak. No one is listening. And the kids go home. And all of us who are so excited at the beginning of the night as a youth staff, as we have our debrief, are like, that was horrible. And then we realized that the one thing we didn't do in the middle of all of our planning was really give it, give it to God and ask him to be in it. And Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. It was, it was actually probably back-to-back months because we had like an outreach every month. I remember the next week, month, we were not excited, probably because we were so still down about the other one. I'm like, well, why are we putting in a lot of work? That was horrible. And people show up, and it had been a really busy month, and I said, well, last month was horrible, and this month will probably be worse. Um, and no amount of planning at this point is going to improve our product. So, so let's pray. Let's just give the rest of the time to pray. And we did. And the game was horrible. It didn't even make sense. I made it up. The rules, they did not make sense. But you know what happened? The kids were like, this is the greatest game ever. I'm like, we can never play it again because I still don't know what's happening. And then we had a worship time, which that night was really bad because it was me leading a cappella, not exactly the most compelling for middle school students. And then we have a lesson, and it was was not a good lesson. Okay, it wasn't. I was bored, and I was really all over the place. I, I didn't even know where I was going. And at the end of the night... After this night of kids having fun and engaging, students coming up to me like, thank you so much for sharing that. That meant so much to me. What you said made absolute sense. And I'm thinking, nothing I said made sense. It was like the Holy Spirit took the words I said, and before they got to their ears, he sanctified them. And that happens. See, because when God says, apart from me, you can do nothing, remember before that, he says, but he who abides in me will bear much fruit. And so as we're making plans for this next year, whether they're personally or spiritually, I want us to remember that we have to be absolutely dependent on the Lord. We we, we will never accomplish things for our own namesake here at EBC. 
because it's not about our reputation. If God raises up other churches in this town that are faithful to the gospel and they're bigger and better and more people want to go there, then God bless them and we should rejoice. Because it's not about our reputation. And there's other good churches in this town. And we praise God for that. And, and if we don't just put on this, this, this effort out of our own strength so that maybe God will be pleased with us, but rather we seek his pleasure by asking him to work through us and let us serve with him. And personally, too, I, I know it's really a lot of temptation. Like, I, I don't have it all, all together as I'm trying to live this Christian life and be a witness. If you're waiting to be a good witness, if you're waiting until you have it all together to share your faith to be a good witness, you're, you're never going to share. But part of that is just the, the realization that God uses broken people. I mean, read the Gospels. The disciples were kind of a mess. But look what happened when they were in his hands. And how he used them to impact and change the world. So I really hope that we, that we go on, that we trust God with what we're doing. Not, not just for ne- next week and a candidating weekend, but for every week. For everything that we are doing, knowing we are absolutely dependent on him. And more written down here. Didn't know how long this would take to get through. So we're not going to read this, but... When we do things in our own strength, this was just a picture. It's kind of like building a sandcastle on the beach. You can make a really great sandcastle, but they don't last. But sooner or later, the tide, the wind comes, or some little kid comes and jumps in the middle of it and knocks it all down. But if we want to do things that are lasting, that, that matter for all of eternity, that are not wood, hay, and stubble, that survive that day, then we need, to, uh, we need to consider the Lord. And with this, I want to just read the, the words here in Isaiah. He says, Have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of heavens and earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases their strength. Even youths shall be faint and weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God has told us he will never leave us nor forsake us. And so let us also be faithful to him and to seek his leading this year. Personally, corporately, in everything that we do, that we might bring him honor and that by letting him have his work in our lives, that we will see just how much, how much he can do with something that you may not feel like you have a lot to offer. But God indeed has taken the foolish things, the things that are not, the things that are despised, to shame the things which are. If, uh, if God can use 12 disciples, if God can use Balaam's donkey, God can use us, but, uh, but we can't do God's work without him. So let's keep that in remembrance. With that, I'm going to close in prayer. We'll conclude our service. Thank you so much for being here. I invite you down to the coffee time or to continue on one of our studies that we have.